In the first video, I claimed that most tools in machine learning and data science boil down, in the end, to two steps. First, write out a probability model. Second, fit the model from data. There is just one standard technique for fitting a model, and it works all the way from simple toy examples up to neural networks. It's called maximum likelihood estimation. Here's the definition. Pause the video and have a quick read. We're supposing that our probability model has unknown parameters, which we'd like to estimate. First, write down the likelihood, which is just the probability of seeing the data that we actually did see. The model has parameters, so the likelihood must depend on those parameters. Then we just do the obvious thing and choose the parameter values that maximize the likelihood. The optimum set of parameters is called, obviously, the maximum likelihood estimator, or MLE. Let's work through some examples, and as we go through them, I'll tell you a couple more things to watch out for. Here's our first example. Pause the video and read. We're being asked to estimate a parameter, so step one, write out the likelihood of the observed data. The observed data is little x, and our probability model says we think it comes from a random variable big X, so the likelihood is just probability that big X equals little x. So what is this? Well, looking back at the question, it tells us what distribution to use for x, it tells us to use the binomial. So look up our reference table of probability distributions, section 1.2 in the printed notes, and copy out the probability mass function. OK, that's the likelihood. Step two, find the parameter value that maximizes it. This is just standard calculus stuff. Differentiate the likelihood, set d by dp equal to zero, and solve for p. I'm sure you've done this sort of maths hundreds of times. Here's the answer. The optimum is p hat equals x on n. By the way, I like to write hat to remind myself that this is referring to the maximum that I found. I think of the hat as the top of a mountain. Oh, one little thing. Before doing this calculus, I should really have sketched out the function to reassure myself that this is a maximum and not a minimum. This is what the function looks like. I plotted it on the computer for x equals 6 and equals 10, like it tells us in the question. OK, that's maximum likelihood estimation. That's all there is to it. This is it. This is the training procedure behind neural networks. You might be looking at me now thinking, that's not what I've read in blog posts and tutorials about deep learning. They told me it's all about prediction and loss functions. They didn't say anything at all about maximum likelihood estimation. Yes, true. You can understand simple neural networks without any probability at all. But the more advanced literature is chock full of probability modeling. And even simple neural network classifiers do, in fact, correspond to probability models. If you're curious, there's a master's course that runs this term called probabilistic machine learning which explains it all. So maximum likelihood estimation is a big deal. We're going to spend the next two weeks doing different flavors of maximum likelihood estimation. And so what I want to do for the rest of this video is show you a few more common patterns and tricks. First, a common trick for making the algebra turn out simpler. Instead of maximizing the likelihood I'll maximize the logarithm of the likelihood. It's got to give the same optimal p hat, whether I maximize likelihood or log of the likelihood, because log is an increasing function. Here's a formula for the log likelihood. I've also left it with a const in. This is from the binomial coefficient at the front, entries x. I'm only interested in finding the p that maximizes the likelihood, so I don't care about non-p terms. The nice thing about log likelihoods is that the differentiation then comes out easier. It's just very simple algebra. OK, next ingredient. Remember the definition of maximum likelihood? But what do you do if the observed data is a whole data set? This is what you do. 
the likelihood of the data set is the product of the likelihood of the individual data points, assuming that is that our model says they're all independent observations. Let's look at an example. Have a read through. As usual, the first step is to write out the log likelihood of the observed data. You should try and do this yourself now with pen and paper. Remember the rules for likelihood, look up the exponential random variable in your printed lecture notes and see if you can come up with the log likelihood formula. First step, the likelihood of the data set is the product of the likelihoods of the individual data points because the question tells us we're modeling them as independent. Next, the likelihood of an individual data point is the probability density function because we're modeling them with the exponential, which is a continuous random variable. It's one of the random variables that you definitely need to know about, and it's on the table in section 1.2 of lecture notes. Here's its PDF. So we just substitute in the PDF formula and this tells us the likelihood of the data set. But hold on, I've seen so many people do this step wrong. In my likelihood formula, we want the PDF of the observation XI, but the standard references tell us the PDF of a generic value X. It's so easy to just copy out the formula and to forget about the subscript, and then you'll get confused because your algebra won't make sense. And Finally, just some tidying up and we get our formula for log likelihood. And then the calculus bit is easy. Here's the answer, the lambda hat that maximizes the likelihood. The third rule of maximum likelihood estimation is that you must always maximize over all the parameters in your model. Let's work through an example. Pause the video and read the question. Before we get going, just a small comment about conventions. This question leaves a lot unsaid. It doesn't explicitly tell us, for example, what the unknown parameters are. You're expected to infer what the unknown parameters are meant to be. In this case, to infer that it's the three properties PL, PR and PU that are unknown. Next, it doesn't explicitly say that the random variables xi are independent, but as we discussed in an earlier video, it's a standard convention that will assume independence unless we're explicitly told otherwise. So dive in. First step, work out the log likelihood of the data set. This bit you should try. Pause the video, get a pen and paper, see if you can find the log likelihood that we're after. You might not have known quite what to write here, but I hope you got this far at least. You realized that we want the product of the individual likelihoods since the random variables are all independent. And you realize that the random variable is discrete. So we want probability that xi equals little xi, not the PDF as we'd have used for a continuous random variable. But to turn this expression into anything more useful, we need to be a bit more creative. Let's invent some notation here. Let NL be the number of levers, that is, the number of cases out of I from 1 to 100, where little xi equals L, and likewise NR and NU. Then, just counting up the number of times each of these happens in our big product, we've got the term PL, NL times, we've got the PR term, NR times, and so on. And so the log likelihood comes out like this. Okay, next step, find the parameters that maximize it. Remember the third rule of maximum likelihood estimation? This problem has three unknown parameters, so we have to maximize over all of them simultaneously. Actually, that's only half true. There are three parameters, but there's also no equation. The three of them have to sum to one. You should remember how to do this sort of constraint optimization from your course on calculus last year. The simple thing we can do here is just pick one of the variables, let's pick PU for example, and write it in terms of the other two. Then we can do a free optimization over PL and PR, and the constraint about all of them summing up to one will automatically be satisfied. 
OK, let's do the optimization. As usual, to find the maximum over two parameters, we set the two partial derivatives equal to zero, which gives us this pair of equations. And then we have to solve these two equations simultaneously. And I can solve them for PL and PR and get this answer. The crucial thing about this problem, about any problem with multiple parameters, is the third rule of maximum likelihood estimation, which says you need to include all the parameters in your model when you do the maximization. It's very easy to miss this, especially when the question tries to lead you astray like it does here. It says, find the estimator for PL. But even though we're only trying to find one of them, we still have to maximize over all the unknown parameters. And then we just throw away the ones we're not interested in. To really understand why this matters, let's see what happens if we ignore the third rule. Let's see what goes wrong if we just do the maximization over PL. This is what we might do. We'd differentiate our log likelihood with respect to PL, find whether the derivative is equal to zero, and solve for PL. Easy. But the problem is this answer is no use because the answer involves PR and we don't know what PR is. The job of an estimate is, well, to give us an estimate for an unknown parameter. And what's the use in an estimate for PL that depends on something we don't know? To emphasize this, here's the word to look out for, estimator. Sometimes MLE is written maximum likelihood estimator. The whole point of this word is that an estimator is something that takes in the data set we have and produces an estimate. It's a function whose job it is to produce an estimate. It's not allowed to depend on things we don't know. It's only allowed to depend on the data set we're given. This is an easy trap to fall into. You should always do a quick sanity check and make sure that any estimates you get are legitimate estimators. So that's all there is to maximum likelihood estimation. Here are two more examples for you to try. I won't work through them in this video, not because they're unimportant. In fact, they're probably the two most important examples in this whole course, which is why I want you to work them out. Pause the video and see if you can solve them. Here are the answers. And if you want to see detailed calculations, please look in the printed lecture notes. OK, one last example. This example will show off a clever math trick for dealing with parameters that influence the range of a random variable. Pause the video and read the question. This question is asking us to estimate the number of sides on a dice. I'm imagining it's one of this sort of dice. Lots and lots of sides, too hard to count the number of sides by eye. OK, well, let's just solve this in the usual way. Write out the likelihood, the probability of observing the data we saw, and the answer is just what it tells us in the question 1 on k. Sketch this as a function of k, and the optimum is clearly to make k as small as possible. I guess k equals 1. Well, or maybe k equals 2. I can't even think what a one-sided dice might look like. OK, this is absurd. How on earth could we have rolled a 10 on a one-sided dice? Or to put it in a more general way, here's a sanity check that we can use on any problem. The maximum likelihood estimator we ended up with didn't depend on the data, and this is obviously absurd. Can you spot what went wrong? Pause the video, see if you can spot the flaw in the reasoning. The trouble is, we didn't write out the likelihood properly. Here's a better answer. The likelihood is the probability of observing the data. But the probability of observing x isn't just 1 on k. There's this extra little clause here which says the probability of seeing anything outside the range 1 to k is 0. Here's a nifty little way of writing this. In algebra, the probability of observing x is 1 on k times the indicator that x lies in the set 1 up to k. 
This integrator function notation is just a nifty way of writing if-then expressions in algebra. 1 sub a is equal to 1 if a is true, 1 sub a is equal to 0 if a is false. Good, now let's simplify. I've rewritten the condition as two clauses. x is in the set 1 up to k if x is above or equal to 1 and if x less than or equal to k. Now, here's a nice thing we can do with indicated functions and turns into times. In words, the only way I can get one out of the and expression is if both clauses are true, and the only way I can get one out of the times expression is if both terms are one, and that's why the two ways of writing it are equal. Now, one more piece of algebra tidying. Here I've simply taken the final term and I've flipped the inequality the other way around. Instead of saying x less than or equal to k, I've written it k larger than or equal to x. I'm interested in maximizing this whole thing as a function of k, and writing it this way just makes it easier for me to think through what's going on. And also, that's the reason I'm not bothering about the first indicator term. It doesn't involve k, so it's not relevant to the maximization I want to do. OK, so now we can plot the likelihood function. The likelihood is 0 for k less than x, thanks to the indicator function. And then for k above or equal to x, it follows the 1 on k line. So the maximum is clearly k hat equals x. OK, so that's maximum likelihood estimation. Let's just summarize what we've got to watch out for. It's always good to sanity check your answers, and these are the two sanity checks we've seen. First, make sure that what we've produced is truly an estimator, something we can work out from the data with no unknown parameters. And second, make sure that it really does depend on the data. Now, we've worked through several examples where we can find the maximum likelihood estimator using calculus. It's almost never the case that calculus will be good enough. Most of the time in machine learning, we have to use a computer and do numerical optimization. The next video will show how.